I'm Dr. Patty Hawken, and I came to the University of Texas Health Science Center in 1976 and stayed until 1997 when I retired. 23 years. Best years of my life. Well, the time of the system school of nursing was really, I guess, the old Chinese proverb, the best of times, the worst of times. It was the best of times because the six schools were under the administration of one president, Dr. Marilyn Willman, and they had one curriculum, one evaluation committee, one committee for admissions, and so forth. That meant that each school sent a representative to these central committees. Now, that helped when our school, for instance, had five faculty. Well, instead of having each faculty member, um, you know, a committee of one, or all five committee of all, on all these various committees, this way they could share across the six campuses. So we had a, the central administration and then all these committees that met as, uh, with representation. This was fine to get started because every school was small and they were just beginning. And the central administration took care of admissions, they took care of uh, some of the hiring of faculty and so forth. So all of that was done centrally and they were located in Austin, the offices were. The nice thing about the system was faculty got to uh, meet one another, their colleagues, and they got to know a lot of different people. The other thing was the uh, campuses would all get together twice a year in a system-wide faculty meeting. Now, when I came in 1974, uh, there was a meeting at our School of Nursing since it was then brand new. We had just moved in in October. And here were about 200 faculty members meeting. It was like a mini convention of some kind. So that was good from the standpoint that the faculty could meet one another, could vote on issues. They brought up all the curriculum issues or admission or whatever at that time. I think the other good thing from my standpoint was the six deans got along very well. We met once a month with the president, Dr. Willman, and we would rotate campuses. So we got to see each other's campus, knew what the problems and issues were and so forth. Plus, there's a colleague that you could always, if you had an issue or a question, you could always pick up the phone and say, have you ever dealt with this before? And you had someone immediately who was a peer who could um, help you with that. The downside of the system was as it grew fast, it became cumbersome. And as the faculty members grew, the numbers grew, it was harder and harder to get things passed, as you can imagine. They, all these issues were brought before each campus, and they were uh, talked about, and the faculty would vote on them at the campus level. Then they'd get to the system-wide meeting. Well, then they had to have conversation again on all these. So it took a long time to get things done. The, uh, system functioned very well. I'm, I want to say something about Dr. Willman, who was our president. She's a very charismatic lady, very smart, and a uh, good sense of humor. And she would move around from campus to campus. And every time she came, she, of course, met with the dean. But then she would pick faculty members and talk with them, students. She would meet with students, try to get the pulse of what was happening from their perspective. She knew everybody. I mean, I was so impressed. Of course, when I got there in 1976, the, uh, can she'd known people for all this period of time, you know, from 1974, I'm sorry, when I arrived. And she knew people for five years. And I was just meeting my faculty. In fact, when I joined the faculty, I think there were 12 or 17 new faculty that joined with me. So they were all new to me. But she would see a faculty member in the hall and say, oh, hi, Susie. Uh, how's your husband? I understand he broke his leg. And I'm going, Really? I, I mean, I didn't know this faculty member of mine had broken a leg, but she knew, she would ask students, you know, she knew their families, she knew their backgrounds. I was extremely impressed. So obviously she was a very beloved person by students, faculty, and staff. And I, the terrible thing was the breakup of the system occurred in one week. And I was in Atlanta, Georgia, I guess the last week in May, and uh, the faculty member in charge, I always had a faculty member in charge when I would go away for a meeting, and the faculty member got in touch with me. Remember, we didn't have cell phones or anything back then, so uh, by calling that office, and they went to the meeting and got me out, to inform me that uh, our president, Dr. Willman, had been fired. That was on 
Monday, and that there would be a Board of Regents meeting on Friday, and that the whole system would be uh, dissolved. Now, that was rather shocking news, to say the least. And of course, the fact they were all upset, students were upset, and I needed to get home as fast as I could, which I did, and flew home. And um, on the way, there wasn't any way to call anyone. I had made a call from the airport, had telephones in, and I did make a call to the system office, but uh, nobody was there to take my call. The president was not available. And uh, when I got home, then I got in touch with the dean in Austin. And first of all, I met with the faculty and tried to calm them down and said, we'll get more information and so forth, and met with students. And the dean in Austin had been in contact with the other deans, and we were all to meet up there. But anyway, we met there, and then we went and visited with the, uh, the at the time, it was the vice chancellor, Don Walker. He became the chancellor. And talked to him and said, look, what is going on? Do you want us all to resign? Are you trying to get rid of all the schools? Are you trying to get rid of nursing? You know, what is behind this? And to this day, I can't really tell you exactly what was behind it, but on the Board of Regents, we did have a physician, a neurosurgeon, who did not like nurses. And uh, I'm afraid that over the course of time, he and Dr. Willman had gotten into quite a few little dust-ups, if you will. And on that Monday, I guess something happened, and uh, he convinced his board, fellow board members, to fire her, so she was fired. But anyway, the, between that whole week, students organized, they formed SOS, the Save Our School, and they raised money and so forth. The um, Board of Regents meeting, they would only allow about 15 people to speak. Um, I learned very quickly, I had given one uh, interview to the San Antonio Light, that was a newspaper at the time, and uh, the president of the Health Science Center at that time, Dr. Frank Harrison, came over and said, um, he was a very kind man, a very generous man, and he said, I just want to say that, you know, you are an administrator. As an administrator, you are, in essence, you know, you're hired by the Board of Regents, and you need to speak the administrative line. In other words, I was, in essence, supposed to support the, what they did. Since I really couldn't support them, uh, it's best, he said, if you have a faculty member speak for the school or students or where somebody outside, but don't you speak because you're putting yourself in jeopardy. That was good advice. And um, anyway, so we did have students and faculty speak at the Board of Regents meeting. Uh, interesting thing, uh, Lucy Baines Johnson was the president of our development board of the system-wide school of nursing. She was very pregnant at the time with one of her children. And of course her mother, Lady Bird Johnson, sat on the board of regents. And uh, Lucy insisted that she would stand in line, you know, and wait her turn. Everybody was given a number that said they were going to speak. And her mother kept saying, bring a chair. For, and she said, no, I'm going to stand. So she stand and then gave her uh, report, if you will, or her uh, idea that she and the development board could raise $300,000. And that's what it took to operate the school for a year, a year and to give the schools a chance for one year to uh, kind of make this transition rather than doing it in a week period of time because that was a very uh, quick turnaround, if you will, to all of a sudden be your own school. Uh, that did not, the Board of Regents voted to uh, dismantle the system-wide school of nursing on that Friday. And uh, Regent Law and Lady Bird, Regent Johnson were the only two that opposed that. But um, as of that Friday then, we became independent schools. We were placed under the uh, leadership of the person, or the school nearest to us. So three of us went under Health Science Center authority and three went under academic center authority. UT at Fort Worth, the closest institution was Arlington, so they became UT Arlington. Our school, uh, as I said, it took quite a bit of time. When Dr. Harrison came over to talk to the faculty, it was the next week after the breakup and everybody was, you know, very still very emotional. And uh, if you can imagine 50 women all very upset and to have this nice gentleman come in and try to calm them down. And so I tried to talk to faculty ahead of time and say, look, he's not, he did not cause this problem. Please, you know, be gracious to this nice man. 
he was very good. He was excellent, and I should not, never have questioned his ability because he really uh, stood up there and listened to the faculty, but he said there's no second-class schools, no second-class deans, because I think the faculty were concerned that we were going to be under the thumb of medicine, and they did not want that. And as it turned out, that's exactly the way it was, that uh, as the dean, I sat on the executive committee. Uh, the president was the chair of that. And all the deans met together once a week. And if there was any permanent university funds that were allotted to the campus, um, we, as a group, executive committee, talked about the money. And we all had proposals, what we needed in our schools. And it didn't all go to medicine. And we it went to dentistry or allied health or or nursing or whatever, we certainly got our share. And so he did practice exactly what he had said he would do. And it all turned out fine in the end, but it was such a traumatic time. It was probably the worst week of uh, my life <laughs> was that week, trying to you know, manage the students, the faculty, and then you know, the other, work with the other deans and so forth. That's the system-wide school of nursing. <laughs> When I first came to the School of Nursing, I was housed in the basement of the medical school. And uh, the faculty were in a, quote, temporary building, which remained temporary for about 40 years after we moved out. Lots of different groups got to uh, an opportunity to be in the temporary building. But anyway, um, I give great credit to Dr. Greta Stiles, the first dean of the School of Nursing, because she and the architect designed the building. And it was beautifully done. I mean, it, it was done with state funds entirely. And to see a state building with a fountain in the middle, a terrace of tile, the colors, that were southwestern type colors, or the greens and beiges and oranges and so forth. And then to have the kivas, that's a, a uh, Indian word meaning ceremonial pit. And these kivas, you'd step down into them. They were circular. They had padded seats around them. And um, they had carpeting all the way up above the seats so that as you walk by the Kiva and people were sitting in there talking, you could not hear what they were saying and vice versa. They could not hear people outside. It was that well insulated. But it was an open area and there were about four or five Kivas that were all lined up. That was very different, you know, a very different look. We were able at that time in the 1970s to have some money from the state for um, artwork, and I had a wonderful fact, a member, Dr. Joanne Crow, who was, had been a commercial artist before she joined. She was the only non-nurse on our faculty. She was in charge of our technical uh, support and our learning laboratory. But anyway, she helped pick artwork, <clears throat> and um, that artwork is still there in the School of Nursing in many places. But um, so the, the building looked very nice, and I took great pride in the building. And one of my assistants to the dean, Rudy Gomez, he was assistant to the dean at that time. He has held many other hats, uh, titles and hats since then. He also took great pride in the building. And, and so if a student would put anything up on the wall, we would take it down and put it on the appropriate bulletin board. And so I got to the point where when students came in every year and I greeted them, I would always talk about the building and say, you know, this is your building, and we want it to look nice like it is, and previous students have kept it nice. And uh, just to remind you, your mother is not here to pick up after you, and so please pick up all your trash and put it away and so forth. And any uh, notice that was put on the front door or hung on a wall, we dutifully took it down and put it where it belonged. And they learned very quickly not to scatter the walls with, uh, pieces of paper, or stick them everywhere. And um, uh, Rudy would take daily uh, walks around the building, make sure it was all neat and tidy. And I was especially proud when we had a lot of visitors come to look at the building. It won some awards. And uh, they would come to the building, and, and it was so nice because it always looked nice. It was, was always presentable. So that was... Uh, wonderful building to move into and since I started in August we moved in in October of that year and then it was dedicated in the next year uh, in the spring and the Board of Regents this is the last building that they officially dedicated so that meant that the board had to come down we had members of University of Texas band playing we all marched into the Yellow Rose of Texas you know so it was quite a nice formal dedication 
and uh, that was that was very special. Uh, he did win a lot of awards for the building, and um, I know Dr. Stiles worked very closely with him. She was responsible for the layout and the saying what it is we needed in the building. And of course, it was built for growth. And when we first moved in, I mean, we've just had more offices and we know what to do with and more space, and we loved it. Every faculty member could choose where they wanted to have their office and so forth. Um, the, I, I don't know enough about the architect to really speak you know, wisely about him at all, except I'm very grateful for what he did and how he worked with Dr. Stiles. Well, the kivas, uh, the students really enjoyed the kiva. They could study in there. there every time you'd go by, you'd usually see students sprawled out studying or little groups getting together. The clinical faculty, the faculty members would take their clinical group of students and they would have meetings in the kivas. And so that was just kind of a warm place, if you will, a nice, uh, place to be. We found that many medical students came to our School of Nursing to study. Uh, they liked the atmosphere. Of course, they may have come for other reasons in the building, but anyway, they enjoyed the atmosphere. They enjoyed the, uh, the Kiva areas and so forth. So it was used a lot. It was uh, quite a useful place. And as you know, we um, added a second building in, uh, that was my last hurrah, but the second part of the building was added. I, it was dedicated in 1996, and that section of the school was added because we needed office space at that time, and we also needed uh, research space. And there's a beautiful research lab that we were able to uh, construct and put in that building, and a lot of space for student lounges and so forth. Now, over the years since then, the uh, School of Nursing took on the whole health of the student body of the Health Science Center. So a lot of that lounge space has been then converted again to um, that area for the student health, which works very nicely. And underneath this, that whole new section, um, uh, Dr. Breslin is very responsible for the, con the, the new addition of that state-of-the-art learning laboratory. So a lot of work has gone on. And then in the last two years, this is 2018, and so the last two years, the entire building has been under reconstruction because it needed new plumbing, you know, after 50 years. It, the wiring, uh, it was not wired for the technology that we have today. And so those were the main uh, pushes, if you will, to get the building redone. Hopefully it will be occupied starting in next year, January, all done with construction. And next year in 2019 is our 50th anniversary, so it'll be just in time for that. I look forward to seeing the end result of that. Very gracious lady. The, the funny part about, well, if you will, funny part about it, my parents came from Florida. I invited them to come for the dedication. They did. Well, my mother went right up to Mrs. Johnson. They just chatted like old friends. I'm looking at my father <laughs> thinking, should I do something or, you know, well, they just went around the building and toured the building, the two of them, and we, you know, toddled along afterward. But it was, uh, she was very gracious and just a warm human being. Um, nice lady. I've, I've met her before on several occasions at the ranch when she had a group out there and so forth at her own ranch. And, and she is just a sweet lady. Just, I couldn't say enough about her, how gracious she has been over the years. The School of Nursing has always been very involved with the community. We uh, had students in the community doing a myriad of projects. They worked in all of the different facilities, the Ella Austin facility, and so forth. And so I couldn't even begin to name them all, and I don't want to leave anybody out. But um, we do health care fairs. Um, two of the things I would like to highlight were the um, prenatal clinic that we started down at the Robert B. Green, if you will, hospital. That was what it was called at the time. And uh, this was started with a joint effort between the medical school's obstetric department and our school of nursing. It, they noticed in the uh, obstetric department that they were doing many cesarean sections on pregnant women. The reason being the pregnant women had not been coming in at all until time for delivery. And so we got together with the uh, medical portion, and I had a wonderful 
several wonderful FACTA members. Uh, Glenda Wooten Rescue was an outstanding FACTA member who'd written a book with another one of my FACTA members, Delight Tillotson, on prenatal nursing care. And talked with Ann Hillstead, who was the director of nurses down there. Anyway, we all got together and agreed that we should start a prenatal clinic. And they agreed to have the facilities, the uh, ancillary personnel, and um, we agreed to supply the faculty members, and then we took students to this clinic. Well, it was a great success. And the one, the two things that really attracted women to the clinic, I think, were one, they got to see a nurse. And they were more comfortable seeing a nurse during their pregnancy than they seemed to be seeing a doctor. And the second thing was we gave them a time to come. Prior to that, they were told, come to the clinic at 8 o'clock in the morning, kind of when your name's called, we'll see you. Well, we're talking about pregnant women, some with children, and sometimes it took all morning or all day for them to be seen. And so no wonder they didn't come to the clinic. But anyway, um, Amy Perkins and Diane Kearney were two of our wonderful nurses down there, um, Jean, hmm, another nurse that came from the clinic, but two from my faculty were Amy and Diane, and Jean Wright was her name. So three of them started, and then students came to the clinic on a rotation basis to see patients and learned a lot. It made such a difference. It ran for about 15 years before they finally took over that. The hospital took it over, and we didn't... Uh, need to send our people down, that they had enough qualified people to do that. But during that period of time, uh, over 5,000 patients, I think, were seen. It was just wonderful. In fact, the head of obstetrics called me one day and said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay, fine. He said, I have a problem. And I said, okay, how can I help? He said, the problem is we don't have enough cesarean sections for our medical students. And I, I said, don't go any further with that. We're not backing off giving prenatal care. I said, you'll have to find areas within the community or not this community, but other communities to send your medical students to. But it was so funny because, and he had to laugh. He's the one that started the whole, you know, well, we're doing too many cesarean sections. And now it was, we don't have enough to do for our medical students for their rotation. So uh, that kind of was a good mark of success, I thought. the uh, Young Family Resource Center. Now that was an interesting adventure that our faculty member got into along with Marion Sokol from Any Baby Can. But this was an initiative that they decided to um, help the community, anyone of any socioeconomic level. They could, we had open classes to talk about babies from one day to three years of age. And uh, they would, they had, I forget how many sessions that they were going to have, but you know, the one, one day would be uh, the first session, then up to three weeks or something, the second session. Well, I went to the first session that night, these are evening classes, just to see if this, how this would work and how it took off. There were over 400 people came from the community to the very first session. They wanted to know, if my baby cries, do I let it cry? Do I pick it up? Do I, you know, I mean, all kinds of questions. And it was such a success for the community to have this resource available to them. And I heard from numbers of people how happy they were that we had started that particular clinic. But that's another one of our successes. I was very, I'm proud of all of them, but that was one I was very proud of. This was an interesting experience for me. Um, I had had a study, uh, the Nursing Advisory Council was established, as you mentioned, in 1983, and I had had a study done prior to that because it seemed like everywhere I went to speak to a group, they'd introduce me as the dean of the UT uh, San Antonio, you know, UTSA, School of Nursing, or not School of Nursing, yes. And I keep saying, no, oh, the University of Texas Health Science Center. And it, it was very clear that they weren't, people in the community were not clear about the University of Texas at San Antonio and the University of Texas Health Science Center. And so I had a study done um, where the, the group that I hired came in, they, they did focus groups, they did questionnaires, everything to find out how the community in general thought about the School of Nursing. And it, it was pretty clear that they were confused they did think that we were connected with UTSA. 
And UTSA got a lot of calls about their nursing program and had to send them over to our health science center. So at the time, I thought one of the things we could do would be to uh, have a nursing advisor council, have people from the community be on, and mainly just to, to help us get the word out to the community, to their organizations that they all belong to, you know, what we were all about. And so I went to the president with this idea, and uh, he was not supportive at first. He said, no, he had a president's council, and the president's council could take care of the communication. And so I had never spoken with the president's council, you know, about nursing. And so I kept pushing this and pushing it. Finally, he said, okay, you can have a nursing advisory council. You can have 10 members. They're not to be asked or told anything before um, we give to, until I give the final word, but you need to gather information about 10 people you want, and then uh, I will approve them, and then the Board of Regents has to approve them. And I, okay, but you can't speak to them ahead of time. So it was a little hard to get information from someone to know, and I said, can I give you 15 names in case some of them, you know, are, are too busy to do this? He said, no, you may give me 10 names. So. The Board of Regents only met every three months, and so I got names, and I did, through very circuitous routes, have to get information about these people, what their background was and what their affiliations were and so forth. Gave them to the president, who then either approved them. He never disapproved. What he did sometimes was take some of them for his presidential council. He thought they would work better there. And then he sent the names forward to the Board of Regents. So it took a long period of time. I think I only started with eight members in uh, 1983, but the sole purpose was to have them learn about the school and then for them to communicate to the community that they were involved in more about the Health Science Center School of Nursing. And so as soon as that was done, I kept going back to him and saying, I need more members. And so I'd give him another list. Well, this took a long period of time to finally gather enough members. Now today, that process is not used at all. If the dean wants a member, she asks the member, and they join the council, and there are a large number of members now of the Nursing Advisory Council. It was tough to get it started, and although we were not supposed to ask for money because that was my job, first of all, as a dean, but also it was the president's council that was supposed to do that, um, we did ask. We did. Uh, ask for money, not necessarily for our council members. I said to them, if you know of anyone, any uh, organization that might be willing, I would be willing to go with you and talk to them about uh, contributing. And um, I remember specifically the one <laughs> was Elaine Spence was one of our, she's now deceased, but she was one of our very good advisory council members. And she said, well, listen, I know the president of USAA Bank and uh, not the USAA, but the bank. And so we went and together over there to meet the gentleman, and uh, she's, we talked beforehand about what should I ask for? You know, should I ask for scholarship money for what, 10,000, 20,000, what, what do you think? So we had this all kind of worked out, and the president of the bank listened to the proposal about the school, I told him about the school, our needs, and so forth, and then he said, uh, well, what, you know, are you thinking about getting? And I said, well, I was wondering, I said, okay, $20,000 made for scholarships. And he said, well, what is the ultimate goal of fundraising? I said, well, really, I'd like to get chairs, you know, uh, endowed chairs. Oh, he said, that's good. We'll give you $100,000 for an endowed chair. <laughs> and I looked at Elaine, and we, it was very hard for us to sit there quietly saying, well, that would be nice, you know. <laughs> with a, So that was wonderful. The hard part for me was trying to explain to my president how we had gotten this kind of money, but anyway, that worked fine. So the advisory council then went from more advice to advice and helping f fundraise. So I think it's helped in the community to get the word out about the Health Science Center School of Nursing at that time, the Health Science Center School of Nursing, what it was, and how it different from the UTSA. The curriculum, of course, is the heart of the school, and um, we started with just the generic baccalaureate program. Students that had had two years of college that came to our school finished with a baccalaureate program, and we started with master's uh, programs. And the master's programs were in the general areas of medical, surgical nursing, psychiatric nursing, and so forth. Um, then 
as we grew, several things happened. One, we had a lot of people in the community who were diploma educated, two-year educated nurses, LVNs, and so forth. They wanted to get a baccalaureate degree, but uh, they didn't want to, quote, start over again. They'd had some basic nursing skills, and they knew some things about nursing, obviously. So we started what is called a flexible process program, and great credit there goes to Dr. Sue Ellen Reed and Delight Tillotson. And uh, they really worked hard on this program. What it meant was that a person that already had nursing knowledge or a nursing degree could come to the school and in a shorter period of time take what we call the flexible process track and go down that track. Um, now, it's interesting, in 1960, I guess I had written a paper on the open flexible curriculum when I was at Case Western Reserve as a faculty member, and we had that kind of a model at that time. This was a little bit different because we included um, people that were LVNs or people that had nursing knowledge. And if they <clears throat> believed that they could pass the, the course and they could come into the program. And so we started that program here in Texas and one of the first schools, again, to get that one going. Also, um, the master's programs, we really did the master's program based on the needs of the community. For instance, um, well, we started a gerontology program because of the needs of the aging. Community health was so important. You know, diabetes and obesity were two big factors in San Antonio, and within our community health program, those were emphasized, you know, how do you help people with these conditions. And then, of course, we had our nurse anesthesia program, and uh, we have a lot of military students in our program, a uh, tremendous number coming here for master's degrees. Wonderful students, just really great, very dedicated, I mean, to earn their uh, degrees. And many of them wanted nurse anesthesia. So I went to Wilford Hall, and uh, Sue Turner was the colonel out there in charge, the nurse, and talked to her about the possibility of doing a joint program with them in nurse anesthesia. Now, obviously, it meant that their physicians would have to be very much on board for that because they were the mentors. Um, I picked Wilford Hall because our hospitals, I'd gone to the other medical groups, and they weren't as supportive of doing nurse anesthetists. Uh, of course, it was a um, challenge. I mean, they didn't want other people in their profession. They wanted to do the anesthesiology. But the military is very receptive because they needed nurse anesthetists in many, many areas. So the physician said they would uh, mentor the students. And so we set up a program, joint program with Wolford Hall and our School of Nursing, and, and that's how that one got started. So that was a, a very exciting program for a period of time and mainly had a lot of military students that took that because they needed that program. The curriculum, one interesting thing about our flexible process curriculum, one day, it had to be late Friday afternoon, I was in my office and that was wonderful because in walked the president with the chancellor and it was Chancellor Hans Mark at the time and um, he came to, to say to me, the chancellor did, that he had had a lot of uh, discussion on the Board of Regents, and they wanted uh, health care programs in the Valley. And they needed them in Harlingen, they needed them in Laredo, and so forth, and, and he, Hans Mark, the chancellor, was to get this going immediately. So he said to me, I think nursing would be the best place to start, and I want you to start with nursing in the Valley. And um, kind of like, as soon as you can get going would be good. And he left. Um, so telling my faculty this was not the greatest news. You know, faculty are in charge of the curriculum, and they like to vote on things. Well, this was something they weren't going to vote on, and uh, they didn't like that, but I tried to explain that when the chancellor says you will do something, that that's something that you do. So anyway, there were many of them that were very supportive, and that was good. Again, Dr. Reed, who is a curriculum expert and is on our faculty, uh, and Delight Tillotson took charge of that because we did both masters and um, baccalaureate, and we took them down to the valley. We did the flex flexible process program down there for the nurses that were there to get their baccalaureate degree, and then uh, for nurses to get their masters. It was very important at that time that they get a master's degree because 
our hope was that they would start a school of nursing in Brownsville. I met with the president, Dr. Garcia at the time, wonderful lady, very supportive, and they wanted to start a program of nursing, but they didn't have the nurse faculty prepared, so that was one reason for a master's. And of course, we eventually took our doctoral program um, both to Corpus Christi because their faculty were master's prepared and they needed some doctor prepared faculty. And we did a um, joint program with uh, Texas Tech. And so the program was, you know, around the state, if you will. That's one of the reasons we got it approved, the doctoral program, was because um, Texas Tech needed, West Texas needed some doctoral education, and we said we'd do it with them and, and take the program out there so their faculty could be prepared. That was a selling point. So that worked out real well. So our, our curriculum evolved uh, depending on the community needs, depending on the, um, I suppose you could say the system needs as well, you know, over the years. And it continues to evolve to this day, I'm sure. Well, being in San Antonio, we're in the middle of a military environment, as you well know. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of military students coming to our school. The thing that was shocking to me, I guess, was when Desert Storm uh, occurred, to realize how many we had in reserve, how many military reservists we had, and all of a sudden, a portion of my faculty and administration, Dr. Barbara Lust, who is my associate dean for undergraduate, was a colonel, and she was called up and all the reserve pretty soon, a faculty member here, a faculty member there, and they were all called up to duty. And uh, plus a large contingent of the student body, especially our master's prepared students. So all of a sudden, we were about 10 or 15 faculty members short, and that is hard when that happens overnight, uh, when you're running a school of nursing. And other faculty quickly stepped in, and I quickly tried to hire part-time people to fill the, the need. And um, as a school then, we did a lot of support for our faculty and students who were, had been called up for Desert Storm. And we sent packages and, you know, did all those wonderful good things, sent the messages a lot. But it was a, a very interesting time. Um, then we had an annual military day because it was sort of a recognition of all of our military students and faculty that we thought, you know, as they start coming back from Desert Storm. And we honored our military in many different ways. We recognized them at various occasions we had and had special events for them and so forth. Very wonderful part of our faculty and student body. The question of the PhD in nursing is, is a good one because uh, to even get that program approved, it was approved by the Regents in 1988, um, but never got approved by the coordinating board until 1990. And a lot of the reason, well, there are several reasons for it, but one was because their UT Austin School of Nursing was moving forward to get their doctoral program at the very same time. And UT Houston, well, UT Austin already had a doctoral program. And to try to explain to people why you needed four of them in the state of Texas was a little bit difficult. Houston backed off and said they would do a Doctor of Nursing Science, which is the um, professional degree where we were doing the, the research degree. And then that's when we decided we could help with Texas Tech. And so that was a new little wrinkle in our thing. But back to the basic reason of a PhD, nursing is based, uh, has to be based on science. Otherwise, you're basing it on old wives' tales or whatever. And an example would be if someone has an open wound um, what do you do? Do you uh, wrap it? Do you leave it open? Do you put on some antibiotic cream? Do you put a hot rags on it? How do you heal that wound? Well, there's been a lot of research done, and one of our faculty members, Dr. Nancy Gerard, was involved with a study here with our biomedical um, institute in working on that very problem. You know, what are the, what's the scientific basis for wound healing? And once you understand the scientific basis for it, then you know how to heal a wound and how to do that and using, um, rather than just guessing at it, and it depends on the nature of the wound and so forth. But nurses learn about that and they learn what kind of wounds uh, will heal faster doing which 
you know, application of which method. That's just one example, but there are many examples that we want to base our practice on science, and we don't want to just base it on hearsay. Dr. Welton McGurn was our first research director, and as I recall, she may have come with a grant, but then she went on to uh, obtain additional grants. And uh, that's when we really started to get on the national level. Dr. Mary Ann Madison was one of our faculty members, and she also had uh, applied for grants. So over the course of time, I had brought in nurse researchers from around the country to speak to our faculty. Dr. Carol Lindemann is a good example. She came in and spoke to the faculty about nursing research and how to do it, and then worked with people individually on their projects, like Mary Ann Madison and Carol, Littner, other, other people. And this was really good to get it started. It was very hard to get it started. If you think of a nurse faculty member, first of all, they have a group of students they're teaching, and that means not just in the classroom, but they take them to the, to the hospitals or out in the clinical area, and they have to be with them for a period of time during every week. And then to say, okay, we want you also to practice, and we want you also to do research and write papers and present and so forth. That's a lot for one individual. And I've always said that uh, I thought that was too much. We should have nurse researchers. We should have nurse academicians. Uh, and not try to find the, all these things in one person. Um, but that's kind of a personal point of view that certainly is, uh, can be challenged. Anyway, many of our faculty members, I'd give them time off, and I'd say you only have to have you know, one class if, as long as you have an active research project. And then they would apply to some of the local, uh, the area foundation and so forth for grants. And finally, some of our faculty, like Dr. McGurn and, and so forth, would apply for the national grants, which are hard to get. But that kind of got it started. We tried very hard to work with other disciplines in the health science center. That's the whole idea of having a health science center, is that we work together. Nurses were um, asked to be on many different grants from the medical school and dental school because there was a nursing portion and we were glad to uh, participate in those. But also, uh, from a student standpoint, we talked to the medical school about doing joint um, teaching efforts with our students and their students. And this was received very positively. And we started with having students in the communities um, our students went to, let's just take Ella Austin as a community center, and our students would be there and they would go out and see families and um, talk to families and interact with families and take care of the needs and go into the house and do whatever was needed if it was to give an injection or change a dressing or give uh, health teaching or whatever. And so the medical students started going with the nursing students. We paired them up and they would make these visits, home visits, together. And that worked very well. The medical student could learn from the nursing student and vice versa. Of course, I always thought that the medical students learned more from the nursing student, but that's an aside. Anyway, uh, the medical students liked it. They really enjoyed that kind of experience to learn more about the community and what was going on. And then we also invited the medical students to join our nursing students in the learning laboratory where they're learning basic skills. Medical students loved it. They had never had that in their curriculum. A lot of that was kind of expected or it was on the job. You know, they learned blood pressure, sort of, okay, this is how you do this. Well, when they learned the, the science behind it and what you're supposed to do and so forth, well, they just thought that was great. So we had a great group of medical students join our nursing students, and the medical faculty joined nursing faculty, and they did that together for a period of time. And I was real pleased to see that kind of interaction going on. We didn't interact as much with the Allied Health Department. That was what it was called at the time, School of Allied Health. The um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and so forth, our students were aware of what they were doing. We had interaction as far as classes sometime would interact, but we didn't do activities together like we did with the medical students. But that was an on and off thing over the years. Sometimes it would be, you know, really we'd get some energetic people in there and we'd do that and then the medical faculty would kind of stop coming and let the nursing faculty do it. The medical students always seem to show up though. 
But uh, anyway, so we did some of that in the 1980s. We didn't do a study on that. We should have, really. But um, I do know that, of course, our nursing students felt very proud because they felt they knew so much more than the medicals at that point <laughs> and with those activities. But uh, we, didn't nev we never did uh, track it or keep data on it, which, again, would have been a wonderful project for someone to do. I was an elected official for the National League for Nursing for a 10-year period of time. Um, the National League for Nursing is the education arm of nursing, and the American Nursing Association is more the political arm of nursing. And in the education arm, um, it's consist, it is comprised of councils, of baccalaureate and higher degree, a council of diploma nurses, a council of two-year nursing programs, a council of LVN programs. National League for Nursing accredited schools of nursing. So this is the heyday. Uh, I was first elected as the uh, chair elect of the baccalaureate and higher degree program, and then the chair, and then the second vice president of the National League for Nursing, and then the president elect, and then the president. So I had 10 years on the board, and they were, they were wonderful years because in, that was the time when nursing education was really moving forward and developing, and uh, so you're right in the forefront of all these, all these developments and all these activities. Um, that was a good experience, and yet there, was, there were a lot of underlying things that went on. I think one of the issues that all my entire life, 40 years or whatever of a career in nursing, that was always coming up was which, uh, what type of education does a nurse really need? And of course, the baccalaureate program said they need baccalaureate education. The diploma school said, oh, diploma's fine. And two-year programs uh, said, all you need is two years. So we've always, and we are still fighting that same question and issue today, where other professions, the medical school knows exactly what it takes to, how many years it takes to be a doctor, how many years it takes to be a dentist, a dentist in the dental school and so forth. Nursing has never defined that. Um, when the two-year nursing program started, the, it started with the idea that, that the two-year nurse graduate would be a, an assistant to the four-year nurse graduate, the baccalaureate graduate, and that all other nursing programs then, the LVN program and the diploma program, would cease. Well, the, nobody sent the memo to the diploma programs, the LVN programs, and then the two-year nurse said no, that you know, the hospital started hiring them and putting them in leadership positions which they weren't prepared for, but which they sometimes accepted, sometimes they were said, no, I really can't do that. But anyway, we continued to make the problem worse rather than ever better. So those are the kinds of issues that the National League for Nursing was dealing with all those years. And um, since then, in the 1990s and close to the year 2000, the accreditation for the baccalaureate and high degree program was taken over by the uh, Associ American Association of Colleges of Nursing, which is the association for the deans of schools of nursing, and they took over the accreditation. That was a very big rupture at that time for the National League for Nursing and for the Deans Association. Fortunately, I was out of office at that time, and uh, so didn't get involved in that, but it was a significant time in the history, for my history, to have been involved for the 10 years with the League, and I really enjoyed that. Judy Shockley was a member of our faculty. She was very knowledgeable about computers, and she was the uh, wonderful person, technician, if you will, that really started technology in our school. And um, she, we hired Evelyn Delgado, uh, another person to work with her, because we became so engrossed, if you will, in this. And she helped the various offices, first of all, administrative offices, get computers and teach the uh, secretaries how to use them. And then they did a tremendous amount of data collection you know, for students that were being admitted, students that do gradings, uh, grading, all the grades were then put on computer and uh, information about students when they came in and so forth. So we really started computerizing all of our areas. And she really was the person behind that. Um, then as we moved into computer technology, Dr. Joanne Crow, who was head of our learning lab, also 
did played a great role in that. And faculty seemed to take to that rather quickly. I was fortunate to be able to get computers for faculty as they wanted them and as they learned to use them. And as I say, especially as the, the offices could do that. So it was interesting. We were computerized. By that I mean we would send memos from office to office by computer. I was always doing handwritten memos, and uh, people never liked to get those. But anyway, uh, now I was able to do it by computer. They really thought that was bad. They were hoping that I would be the last to learn, I think, how to use the computer. But anyway, I could communicate now with the faculty very quickly. Um, I was interested that the medical school, uh, the main office, the dean's office, I always used to kim kid uh, the dean, that uh, their office was still using typewriters. And we were, you know, all of our offices were using computers. So they were one of the last to get computerized. He really kind of wanted to wait on that. I think a lot of people were very dedicated to their own typewriters or whatever, and they knew how to use them and so forth. But anyway, we computerized everything very quickly. The other thing that Judy Shockley did, she took all the exam questions from every faculty member, put them on computer, and we uh, used these and tested them over and over again on students, the exam questions. And um, we eventually sold that database of over 6,000 exam questions to the National League for Nursing. And they paid, I think, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 for that, which was a lot of money back then. Um, the use that they had of them, they used to use exam questions to give to students that were comparable to state boards. So schools would buy their exam questions from the National League for Nursing, and they gave those exams to students, and, and it, they did a lot of research on that to see that they're quite comparable to state boards, and if they passed the NLN exam, they were able to pass state boards. And a lot of that database came from our school, so I was real proud about that. So we, we were very uh, up and coming in that area. No wonder they have to rewire the School of Nursing. See? <laughs> Let me just say there were some things that were developed over the period of time that I was, that I was rather proud of. One was the um, initiation of a, let's see, Council of Nursing Service Administrators. And when I first came here in 1974, I really, I had to go to all the different hospitals, if you can imagine, agencies and communities, so sort of get to know people. And we were having, we had students in those areas, so we did need to have contracts, which had been started with Dr. Stiles, the contracts with the agencies that they used. Now, we expanded as we added faculty. We needed more agencies, more um, areas to have students get clinical experience. At the same time, San Antonio College, Incarnate Word, were, they have nursing programs, and they were running to the same agencies and trying to get um, their students. In, and they would, it was got to be the point where it was who could get there first, you know, who could run over to Methodist Hospital first and say, well, we need this floor on these days. And I thought, there's something wrong with this. So first of all, I met with all the nursing service leaders, and I eventually then did start the Nursing Service uh, Administrative Council. And we met uh, once each semester for lunch here at the Health Science Center. And uh, I'd bring them up to date on what was going on with nursing, and also they would share with each other. Many of them had not even met each other. They would share with each other what they were doing in their agencies or in their community. Then I got together with the, the deans or the directors, actually, of the other schools of nursing, the LVN programs, the two-year programs, and diploma programs, Baptist, and so forth, here in San Antonio, and said, we this needs to be done differently is how we go to the agencies and ask for different floors. We know what we need for our students. We know first-year students need, let's say, the medical floor where they can take blood pressures and so forth. Third-year students may need another floor where they have a, a severely ill patients. And I said, why don't we as a group, education group, get together, talk about that, and among ourselves decide we want to go to, let's say, Methodist Hospital and say, UT wants the fourth floor on Tuesdays from 8 to 12, and SAC wants it on da-da-da, and so forth. And I said, if we did it among ourselves, we would we'd do better because then it isn't the agency having to make up 
their mind and saying, okay, we're going to let so-and-so come, or they didn't have any basis really to make a choice. It was kind of whoever came first. Sold that idea, and uh, then I hired a clinical liaison person, and full-time job was to keep up the contracts, to uh, meet with the other education people, and to decide who would go to what agency, you know, what floors we needed. It, it's a very complicated thing to get nurses out into the community and into the hospitals. You don't just go do it. As I said, you have to have a, a legal contract with them to do it. And that worked out very well. I was proud of that, that we got that settled, that we weren't, you know, tripping over each other to run into the agencies and so forth. And, um, and the clinical liaison person was throughout my tenure. I don't know if they still have one, but that was a very useful person to, to have and to use. And I liked getting together nursing service administrative people. Um, and then I met on a monthly basis with the director of nurses of Methodist, VA, and University Hospital. And we went to lunch once a month. That was just to keep, those are the key institutions that the Health Science Center as a whole was using for dental, medical, allied health and nursing. And I thought it was very important that I kept in touch with those people just on a um, social basis, but also if any issues came up that we could get them settled at that point. And that uh, over the years turned out to be a very, very good thing to do. So I was pleased with a lot of the connections, if you will, that we made as a school of nursing. And um, faculty, of course, were always very good for their connections, you know, and institutions and so forth. But many, many things, you know, happened. I can't think of any more specifics at the moment, though. It's been a remarkable 23 years.